Welcome to Talk of the Bay. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman, and I'm very excited to have the author of The Petroleum Papers here with me today on Talk of the Bay. Jeff Dembicki is the author of a new book that examines the intentional cover-up of information that the oil industry knew about climate change, but not only refused to release, but they actively discouraged the public from knowing about it. In fact, wanted to misinform the public through a very concentrated campaign. So this book covers ground that we may have heard before, but in a much greater detail. What inspired you to go about digging up this information? Well, so I grew up in Alberta, Canada, and for listeners that aren't aware, that's home to the Canadian tar sands, which is one of the biggest oil operations on the planet. And so, you know, I was surrounded by oil literally from a very young age. My brother and I used to play at a playground that was underneath an oil refinery. So when we were on the monkey bars, we could see the towers shooting flames into the air. And so later on, I got quite interested in climate change in high school after seeing an inconvenient truth. And I decided to write about climate change after I became a journalist. Um, But it was, I didn't really start looking deep into the oil industry's lies until I learned about Coke Industries and the role that the Koch brothers had played in spending millions of dollars to fund far right think tanks spreading climate change denial. And when I was looking deeper into the Cokes, I realized that one of the most profitable and important pieces of their business empire is a refinery in Minnesota that's one of the biggest importers of tar sands oil from Canada in the entire US. And so for me, it all kind of came together when I learned that. You know, this oil refinery I'd played under as a kid was linked to Coke Industries and this massive disinformation effort all across Canada and the US. And so that that really led me into, into writing this book. Tell us what the connection is with the far right. You know, we're watching other countries have leaders elected that espouse certain values like anti-immigration views, but how does petroleum and climate change fit into that rubric of beliefs and why is it associated with political far right? Oil and gas has always been associated with really reactionary political forces. And so a key example of that is one of the first major developers of the Canadian tar sands um, was a U.S. company called Sun Oil, and one of its leaders was Howard Pugh. And so Howard Pugh has been referred to as a sort of an early, you know, Koch brothers type person of the 1930s who was staunchly anti-communist. He hated FDR's New Deal. And he saw the development of a massive oil and gas operation up in Canada, which could supply oil to the US as being something that could really fight against the godless communism that he saw marching across the entire world. And from that early date, oil and gas has always been associated with these types of very right-wing reactionary politics. Um, Coke industries. I can, I can, sorry to interrupt you, but I can understand them wanting to be against regulating their industry, but I, it is a little bit perplexing to me why they are so against other social issues and programs, you know, that it's part of the package. Um, but we're linked really early. Oh, sorry, I, I missed that question because the internet froze for a oh, second. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the question was, I can understand the Koch brothers and their ilk and their predecessors being against regulation and government intrusion into their business because they want to make profits. What I have a harder time understanding is why some of these same actors get involved in other issues like anti-communism, unless they think that the government's going to seize their assets. Is that where it's coming from? 
I think it's part of a, an entire worldview that really just celebrates and venerates the individual and private enterprise and sees any kind of state action or public sector as being illegitimate. And environmental regulations um, are a part of that. And when oil companies oppose those regulations as part of a broader philosophical um, support for sort of a libertarian worldview, it's also very financially convenient to them also. Right, so they're kind of using this strain in American thought of libertarianism to push their anti-regulatory agenda in some way using that emotional feeling that people don't want to be having government interference in their lives individually, but then also they're saying, conveniently, we don't want to be regulated. Exactly. I think that's a good way to look at it. So I have to say that emotionally reading your book, I was, I just sort of sat there and cried at the end because it was, it seemed to reveal some level of evil that these people are willing to literally take down the planet's future for their own profit and and lie about their motives for doing so. The lying part on top of the actual impact to me was the hardest part to swallow because it's not like they didn't know. And that seems to be where you spend a lot of time in your book is kind of the morality of if you knew, why didn't you say anything? And then when you did say something, you said the opposite of what was needed. You said it wasn't a problem or we didn't really know what was happening. Can you talk more about that particular strain in your book? Yeah, and that's something that that really drove me to want to make all of this information public. And, you know, when I'm saying that oil companies lie, this isn't just something that I'm pulling out of the air. I reviewed hundreds and hundreds of confidential oil industry documents going back decades where they're very explicit about how they're misrepresenting the science around climate change. And one document that really stuck out to me was produced by a company called Imperial Oil in the early 90s. And that company is owned by Exxon. Imperial operates in Canada. So in the early 90s, the Exxon owned Imperial studied solutions that could fix the climate emergency. And it determined that one of those solutions, a price on carbon emissions could result in quote, stabilization of CO2 emissions. So you could eventually effectively get the crisis under control by doing something like this, Imperial learned. But it also determined that such a policy would potentially hurt its oil and gas profits. And so it created a confidential memo for executives at the company and at Exxon um, that contained talking points for how they should try to make climate solutions look bad and economically reckless to policymakers and people in the media. So at this early date, when we really could have gotten the emergency under control and the oil companies could have pushed for these solutions, they instead spread lies to the public about them. When you end your book with sort of wondering what if we had done some of those things earlier, it's kind of a heartbreaking conclusion to say what would have happened? Where would we be right now? I'm talking to you on the e on the afternoon eve of uh, the landfall of Hurricane Ian that is going to wreak havoc on Florida and has already submerged several of its outer islands. Um, we're seeing, you know, something that went from a category three to category almost five in 24 hours, which has the all the hallmarks of climate change. Ironically, that's where Ron DeSantis lives, or, or you know, his governor, and he's uh, been pretty staunch denier of climate change. Is it productive? Or is it just heartbreaking to spend time wondering what if we had done this earlier? You know, what is gained by wondering that is important to know. I think it's productive to look at all of the times when oil and gas companies knew how to fix the emergency, but then intentionally sabotage the solutions. 
And the reason I think that's productive is because for so long, the narrative that we've had around climate change is that it's something for which we're all equally responsible. We all drive cars and need to heat our homes. This is repeated over and over again to the point where it almost feels like common sense. And this is a narrative that really benefits the oil and gas industry and prevents people from holding it accountable. And what my research has shown me reviewing all of these confidential documents is that, in fact, there were many moments when we could have really gotten climate change under control and avoided some of the crazy impacts that we're seeing right now. And it was a handful of companies and a handful of executives that lied to the public about it and ensured that global emissions would keep rising. And they were aided by politicians on the right as well who were willing to carry their water for them, essentially, I guess, because they gave them large contributions under Citizens United, which seems to be the point at which these companies really got leverage over the politicians. Yeah, the oil and gas companies were able to leverage right wing politicians um, by destroying a partisan consensus that fixing climate change would be good for everyone and would benefit the economy. I mean, it seems crazy to remember, but there was a time not too long ago when Republican administrations saw environmental action as a good thing, for example, under Reagan or George H.W. Bush. And um, a company like Coke Industries started to become very, very concerned that aggressive climate regulation would destroy its fossil fuel business. And so it intentionally set out to polarize the issue, to create mobs of people across the country who could vote out politicians who didn't sufficiently deny the crisis and effectively forcing one of the major political institutions in the US, the, Republic, the Republican Party, into the most reactionary possible position on this issue. Yeah, and, and they seem to be easily hijacked by conspiracy theories. I, yeah, I was interested to see the word conspiracy in your title because lately it's become such a bad word for people who fall into paranoid thinking about crazy ideas. Um, so this is a true one. You've documented it. Do you worry that um, that word is going to come back and bite you? Or has anyone like pointed out that right now we're all worried about people who believe in conspiracies, especially the wacky ones that go into pizza parlors with guns thinking there's a child pornography ring run by Hillary Clinton there. So how do you uh, justify using that word in this day and age? I'm curious. So yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you picked up on that word because that's something we had a lot of debate about when um, the publisher and I were trying to decide the title for this book. And then I got thinking, you know, what, what, does, a, what does a conspiracy mean? And what, what have I seen in these hundreds of confidential documents that I look at? And what, what I saw in those documents was several of the world's major oil producers learning about climate change science internally and then coming up with plans to flood the media with disinformation and to make people doubt that it's real and then to, to leverage this denial coalition they had to totally alter politics in both the US and Canada and other places around the world with the ultimate goal of blocking any regulations on their industry. And I thought, well, you know, if this isn't a conspiracy, then I don't know what is. It does fit the bill. And, and I'm glad that you stuck with using it. Again, I'm speaking with Jeff Dembicki. He is author of The Petroleum Papers, Inside the Far Right Conspiracy to Cover Up Climate Change. And again, as we sit here talking, there's a major hurricane hitting Florida, um, the strongest it's seen in decades. Part of your book has the heartbreaking story of a woman in the Philippines who experienced Hurricane Haiyan, which I guess was also 
tropical storm, but not like they had ever seen. Can you um, sketch out her story a little and how she dovetails with this other story you're telling about these people who, you know, are hungry for power and profit over even the future of, don't they even have kids or grandkids? I always wonder this, like, do these people even have people they're worried about surviving this or do they think they'll live in a gated community and have people bringing them meals? Um, that's a separate question, but let's let's go back to the individual story for a moment and, because it really emotionally gripped me the way it was told. So I was in the Philippines a few years ago on a reporting assignment and I visited the city called Tacloban City, which had been absolutely destroyed by Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. That was one of the biggest storms ever recorded anywhere in the world. And climate change was a big factor in the storm's intensity. And so I met this young woman, Joanna Sustento, who'd seen um, most of her family killed in that disaster. And after, after it happened and she survived, she wondered, you know, how am I going to put my life back together? How can I possibly make sense of this terrible thing that had happened? And she didn't actually know a ton about climate change at the time of the disaster. She didn't think about it a lot. Um, when she started learning about how um, greenhouse gas emissions had contributed to the storm's intensity, um, that, that really got her thinking about it in a different way. And then around that time, there was all of this reporting done on oil companies knowing internally about the climate dangers of their products and then ignoring those warnings. And incredibly, in some of those internal oil and gas industry reports, they actually predicted that their own products could make tropical storms worse. This was, this was decades ago, and so they, they knew the dangers. And for someone like Joanna, this wasn't just abstract. She had seen a storm like that kill her own family members. And so when she learned about these documents and the ignored warnings, she thought that this is one of the biggest crimes that she had ever heard of. And she decided to devote the rest of her life to holding these companies accountable. One of the things she says in the book um, is that her dad was, you know, always looked down on people who protested as complainers. So she had to overcome her conditioning that people who spoke out against the powerful were somehow just making trouble or complaining about things that they had no business complaining about, which I found interesting that, you know, there's a culture of just go along with the status quo. And she had to break through that in order to speak out about her own story. But her story is so heartbreaking and powerful. I mean, she gets into great detail about thinking that the water coming in under the door is just rain. And then she realizes it's the ocean and suddenly they're waist deep and then they're crawling onto the roof and then everybody gets separated, hanging onto logs and she at one point just gives up, you know, and decides to die. And if that's what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. And that, at that moment, somehow she floats out of the debris and is able to save herself, but um, not her mother. She actually tries to save her mother, and her mother drowns right in her arms. And it's just the way it's told really makes you feel like you're there. And I couldn't help but think of all the warnings being given to people in Florida to get away from the ocean and how not, some people are not listening because uh, they have never experienced something like this or they think they can ride it out because they're proud people or whatever. So it really struck home listening to her story, reading it. Um, you got her to tell some pretty personal details and that makes it more real, I think, as a reader. Well, and, and with Joanna, for a long time, she didn't want to talk about her story publicly because it was so painful. And then she eventually got connected with people who were doing climate justice work in the Philippines, and many of them were high-end survivors also. And they, they began telling their stories publicly. And, and Joanna and these other survivors realized that the rest of the country and the rest of the world needed to hear their stories because 
to them, climate change was no longer this just abstract thing that could be easily waved away. It was one of the most profound and terrible things that had ever happened to them. And I think more and more Americans are also having these types of experiences and sharing their stories also. I remember probably 20, maybe 25 years ago, there was a statement that was often made by scientists which said, by the time you can experience climate change, it's going to be very late in the game. By the time it starts affecting people enough to get them to believe because they have firsthand experience, it's going to be very hard to turn the boat around, so to speak. Um, were they right in saying that, you think? I think there's always the opportunity to make the damages of climate change um, better than they can be. There's, there's always a huge benefit to action. But what my research for this book showed me is that starting in the 1970s and 80s, like Ex Exxon was, they, they paid a, a million dollars for a super tanker that could measure emissions going into the atmosphere. Like they, they knew how bad this was gonna get. And um, one of the interviews for my book was with um, Bill McKibben, founder of 350 and, and an amazing environmental writer. And I, I asked him like, what, what would have happened if, if these companies had, had shared their life-saving knowledge with the public and used their vast political and financial influence to help push for the solutions we need? Because you have to remember, these companies knew about climate change before the public did. When James Hansen uh, made his speech to Congress in 1988, which first put public, which first put climate change on the public's agenda, the oil and gas companies had had known for decades. And so McKibben told me, you know, at that moment when Hansen did his speech, if the CEO of, of Exxon had shared all of their knowledge and started lobbying the government aggressively, we would just be in so much of a better place right now for climate change. Global emissions might have already peaked, he told me, and we might be heading down the other side. There's no law, and you do cover the law a lot in your book, but there is no law that says a private company can't ruin the environment or ruin our planet's uh, atmosphere. As far as you know, there's no jail for people who ruin our entire future of humanity for their own private gain. Is that true? There doesn't seem to be, does there? But you, there... You would think there should be, that, that these people are, are perpetrating not only crimes against humanity as defined by wars, but crimes against the entire ecosystem of the planet. It's not just the humans, it's the polar bears, it's you know the leopards and the tigers and everything else on earth that is going is starting to be impacted. You would think that these people would be the biggest criminals in the entire history of the earth in a, in a certain way because of the number of people that are going to be impacted by this. There's no doubt that millions and millions, if not billions and billions of people are going to be affected by the lies that the oil and gas industry has told over the last few decades. And, and there may not be laws now about um, um, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but there are laws against lying to the public. And, and those laws are the basis of dozens of lawsuits against the oil and gas industry that are now moving forward um, in US courts. And many of those lawsuits rely on the same confidential oil and gas documents that I was looking at in the book. I assume you have read and watched the film uh, Merchants of Doubt. I actually haven't seen that film, but I'm, I'm familiar with this work and, and with the authors behind it. Right. You have a, Naomi Oreskes uh, mentioned in your book. She is a researcher who's done a lot of work on these think tanks and how they become fronts for uh, climate deniers. And they have people who with, uh, with lots of credentials, but not in that particular field, who are willing to sell themselves out for a lot of money to uh, promulgate these lies. Can you talk about how uh, 
uh, Casting Doubt, which is the name of her book and movie, Merchants of Doubt, but how they didn't even need to necessarily counter the science. All they needed to do was seed this aura of that this isn't settled science, that we don't know yet. Um, can you talk about that particular psychology at work on um, people who obviously would rather not believe this is true because it's horrible once you actually face that it is? So seeding doubt is a psychological kind of a tool that these think tanks use. Tell us how that worked in this case. So the, the one of the very first instances I could find of this strategy being used was at a conference in Washington, D.C. in the early 1990s. And the conference was organized by the Cato Institute, which is a think tank founded by the Koch brothers. And so at this conference, a lot of these sort of fake climate academics got together and they discussed ways that they could make the public think of climate change not as a scientific fact, but a sort of um, a political theory that was up for debate. And several of the scientists who appeared at this Koch-backed conference had been part of a very experimental campaign in the early 1990s to test this messaging out on people. Because when, when climate change first came onto the public radar, most people accepted it. They saw it as a threat and, and there was a lot of political pressure to do something about it. And, and that really threatened a lot of the big fossil fuel producers. And so they tested out messaging in three small communities in the US um, where they would ask someone their views on climate change. And then they would present a fake scientist saying, we don't know if this theory is true. There are some doubts about it. And afterwards, they measured the results. And it was, it was really profound. Um, in the test communities, where large majorities of people had accepted the science with urgency, after hearing from the fake scientists and the doubt, the numbers of concerned people went way, way down. And they saw the, this strategy as being such a success that they repeated it nationally and internationally for decades, and we're living with the impacts of that now. We can thank Edward Bernays for this, because um, in my mass media class, we teach about um, you know social manipulation by the powerful. And he figured this out. He got women to smoke by showing a bunch of debutantes smoking as a, uh, they, they called them torches of freedom, because he used their desire for women's rights in a way against them to get them to be rebels, to smoke in public, which was taboo. And this got covered by the press and pretty soon women were smoking in great numbers. And they used this to, this doubt idea with the tobacco industry. And of course the petroleum this and said, oh, we can just lift that playbook and hire these same people because they're experts in obfuscation and doubt to sell doubt. have worked fabulously sadly and there are still people in fact i just heard a documentary about eastern kentucky flooding one of the coal miners saying i know we have problems with strip mining and runoff but this has nothing to do with climate change these the 13 inches of rain that fell overnight you know just would not go there and that's because their livelihoods threatened or their you know they feel like their way of life is threatened and that's pretty easy to get people to want to disbelieve something there is uncomfortable so it's all about psychology um, neither you or i assume are psychologists but it, it's easy enough for us to understand why this would be so successful is that right exactly yeah when confronted with something as disturbing as climate change it's kind of reassuring in a way to hear someone say that this isn't actually such a big deal. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in this conversation has happened over the last few decades, but these, these strategies are very much still in place. They've, they've just evolved a little bit to become a little bit more savvy. But for example, um, there's a big hearing going on um, in Congress investigating how oil companies are misrepresenting their plans to fight climate change. And 
that investigation released a bunch of documents produced by companies like Exxon and Shell. And in these documents, people at the company acknowledge that the company's climate promises are mostly just public relations. And at the end of the day, the companies are only really interested in drilling for more oil and gas. And so we're, we're still being deceived all the time. We're being told that powerful companies are on it. Don't worry about it. And I think to me, that's the newest form of, of denial that results in the same thing. Delay, delay, and delay. However, um, there are people who track beliefs and regardless of how much um, garbage they're spewing into the information ecosystem, the Center for Climate Communications at Yale says that about half of Americans are extremely or very sure global warming is happening and fewer than one in 10 are as sure it isn't happening. So it's starting to erode and probably because of what we were talking about earlier, more people are at least know someone who's been personally affected. Um, so it's still not, I mean, half is still half, not 70 or 90 percent of people who are sure it's happening. But that's only one question they asked. Um, they asked one about being human caused and about six in 10 think it is. So that's up from, you know, under 50 percent. So it is increasing, um, and that's good news. The the awareness, um, maybe because, like what we said, more and more people are actually experiencing or know someone who's experienced said impacts. I want to go back to the lawsuit idea. You have a couple of lawsuits. The one we talked about, which is going to be holding people accountable for their lying from the oil industry. There was another that was about damages. Can you talk about a couple of those lawsuits that might have shown that there was a direct correlation between damages experienced by major disasters and the oil companies? Yeah, and so one of the, the major early people behind these climate lawsuits was a lawyer named Steve Berman, and I interviewed him for the book at his office in Seattle. And Steve Berman is famous because he was part of a legal effort to sue the big cigarette companies in the 90s. And that resulted in one of the biggest legal settlements in human history. And Berman thought, you know, these cigarette companies lied to the public and um, states had to, to pay the cost for that in terms of all the medical expenses for people with cancer. And he thought the, the dynamic was quite similar for climate change. Oil and gas companies lied to us and kept omitting. And as a result, cities like San Francisco now have to pay for incredibly expensive seawall upgrades due to um, the rising oceans caused by climate change. And so in 2017, Berman helped um, San Francisco and Oakland launch lawsuits against big oil um, seeking damages for all of the taxpayer money that those cities are now going to have to spend protecting them from climate change. And the model of those lawsuits is now being replicated in cities all across the U.S. So it's really going to rely on judges ultimately um, making these decisions. Um, do we have a lot of judges that are in the pocket of the former president or are we in good shape where they are open to arguments from scientists and lawyers about this topic? Well, the Trump administration certainly appointed a lot of judges that were friendly to it. However, one really interesting development in some of these lawsuits is that they have been clearing early legal hurdles and the judges um, allowing the lawsuits to clear those hurdles were Trump appointees. And I think that speaks to the, um, the staggering amount of evidence that people bringing these lawsuits have on their side about the oil companies lying. It doesn't matter what your politics are. If you see the documents showing very clearly that oil and gas companies misrepresented their own science, it's, it's obvious to you that those companies did something wrong. 
And um, I've, I've seen very interesting polling showing that people across the political spectrum, even Republicans, when they hear to the extent to which they've been lied to by some of these companies, it makes them want to hold the companies accountable and galvanizes them to take action on climate change. And that was the biggest fear of the oil companies was public action. That's what they were trying to neutralize. And that's what they seem to have trouble continually putting down because people want a life for their children and their grandchildren. They do not, regardless of political party, they do want to live a life. And every time you look at the news, there's a new flood or hurricane or some disaster happening, it seems, whether it's a fire or a flood or hurricane. And it, at a certain point, the lies just become kind of ludicrous at some point, And we're hoping the judges see that as well. If you just join me here on Talk of the Bay, I'm speaking with Jeff Dembicki. He is the author of The Petroleum Papers, The Far-Right Conspiracy to Cover Up Climate Change. And I really am interested in this topic, partly because I teach about media to students and how the media has had trouble getting their brain around climate change story. Um, and they've been falling prey to repeating some of the lies or doing false equivalencies, you know, both sides reporting. But if one side's lying, that's not really neutrality on the part of the journalists. They're just carrying water for people who have an agenda. So it's really been tough, I've noticed, um, to see the way media has kind of at times failed. I think it's getting better. What is your take on how the communication piece of this gets played out in terms of these lies getting promulgated or squashed by reporters. Obviously, you're a reporter. You're doing a great job digging up this stuff and presenting it to the public. What do you think about your journalism colleagues and how they're doing? I think that there has been a massive increase in climate coverage over the last few years. And that's, that's reflected the public really starting to worry about this. And I think it's also reflected the, um, the Biden administration's efforts to do something about climate change. The administration just passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which, you know, despite all its flaws, is still one of the biggest investments in climate action in U.S. history. So there's there's a lot changing in that sense. But, you know, you, you can watch coverage on major network news of a climate disaster and not necessarily know it's climate change. Or if that network makes the, the connection to climate change, they might not say that the climate change is being driven primarily by the fossil fuel industry, which isn't a political position. That's just a scientific fact. And to me, the most disheartening thing while reporting this book was learning about the opportunity we had for right-wing media to really educate people about climate change. There was a moment in the late 2000s when Rupert Murdoch started to take climate change very seriously and said that his entire News Corp empire would start reporting about it and educating the public. And Murdoch at the time, um, even talked about speaking with Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly at Fox News about putting more climate messaging. What into happened? Their shows. How how did that go awry? Because now it's sort of the center uh, propaganda machine for climate deniers. Absolutely, and I I wish I had been in on the conversations where that effort started to to fall apart. But one one major factor in that. I believe um, is starting in the in the early 2010s when the Obama administration was trying to bring in ambitious climate legislation. Coke Industries funded a bunch of groups supporting the Tea Party uprisings all across the U.S. And so you had these like spontaneous looking, very far right protests that were then directed against climate legislation. And Fox News at the time was reporting on all this, embedding its reporters in it. And the network got pulled very far to the right in, in all of its sympathetic coverage of the Tea Party. And you could really see this happening in its climate coverage. 
a few years before this, Fox News was doing like pretty straightforward explainers about how climate change works, which are just incredible to read now. And then a few years um, after the Tea Party really took off, they were running pieces saying that the climate emergency doesn't exist. Amazing. And they have such an outreach power. Um, and we saw this, you know, during the 2020 election where they were actually doing sort of straight election coverage. And then there was this internal debate about whether they should release the results that Joe Biden won. Uh, they ended up calling it after all and got furious blowback from some of their far right viewers. Um, and now, of course, they've kind of reverted back to la la land where Sean Hannity says things like, well, we don't really know. And there's the Merchants of Doubt playbook. We're not really sure what happened during this election. Well, yes, and many judges have certified that Joe Biden won. But this idea that we're not really sure leaves it open for, I'm just asking questions, but I don't think he won, right? And that's the same playbook. And it seems to work wonders um, if you're trying to sell advertising, <laughs> which is their main thing. All right. Well, we have only a little bit of time left, but I wanted to end by asking you, uh, what should we be looking for in this story as it unfolds? Because as you said, we're right in the middle of it. It's um, where you left off was pretty recent. You know, a year ago, you just finished the book. It just came out. If you were to write an epilogue or the next chapter, what would it be about? Well, I think one takeaway people can have from my book is that it's always at the moments of greatest opportunity for fixing climate change that the lies are going to start swirling around the fastest and loudest. And that, that makes sense because um, it's at those moments of climate opportunity when the oil and gas interests are most threatened. And so I think with the Biden administration preparing to spend um, many, many billions of dollars on climate action, we, we should expect a full on frontal assault of, of the truth and be prepared to resist it and also to, to see it for what it is. We're, we're in a moment now to, to make things quite a bit better for a lot of people around the world by fixing climate change. And, and I think now more people are waking up um, to the fact that that they've been lied to and we have to cut through those lies in order to fix this thing. Well, I really thank you for writing this book as hard as it was for me to read. I'm glad I read it and I highly recommend our listeners read it. It's called The Petroleum Papers, The Far-Right Conspiracy to Suppress Information About Climate Change. I know I botched the subtitle there. Why don't you say it again so people have the proper one? <laughs> It's the petroleum papers inside the far right conspiracy to cover up climate change. By Jeff Dembicki, who has been my guest here on Talk of the Bay. Jeff, I want to thank you for writing this and uh, keep writing and keep doing your investigative journalist work. It's so important. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Really appreciate your time today.